Welcome to another Pearson Centre webinar on the theme of COVID and beyond. My name is Francesca Iacorto and I'm an, an advisory board member at the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs at the National Airlines Council of Canada. As many of you will know, the Pearson Centre is a progressive think tank that addresses the big economic and social challenges of the day. In that context, I am pleased to welcome you to the 23rd webinar on major policy issues related to COVID-19 and how they are affecting our society. Our ongoing project is called COVID and Beyond, recognizing that we have a lot of issues to address as we plan for the recovery and rebuilding that will be slow and long. This will also be a, an important time to reimagine Canada. However, before we start with our program, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who make these events possible. First, a very special thank you to the Honourable Margaret Nori McCain, who's our gold sponsor today. And of course, our two sustaining sponsors are Canada's Building Trades Unions and the International Association of Firefighters. While these webinars are free to attend, we invite you to visit our website at the Pearson Centre, all in one word, .ca and make a contribution. Now to the panel. Today we will talk about national childcare and whether it should be in the next throne speech. And we have a stellar panel with us to do so. We have with us Carrie McQuaig, who's a fellow in childhood, early childhood policy Atkinson Centre for Society and Child Development at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Welcome back to the Pearson Podium, Carrie. Thank you. We also have with us uh, Craig Alexander, who's a partner and chief economist at Deloitte. He's a leading Canadian economist with over 20 years of experience in the private sector as a senior executive and economist in applied economics and forecasting. And we have with us today as well, Dr. Hedy Fry, who's the longtime member of parliament for Vancouver Centre, and also a very long time proponent, proponent of national childcare. She's also a former secretary of state for multi multiculturalism and the status of women. And last, but certainly by no means least, we have uh, with us today, Dr. David Philpott, who's professor at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, with a specialty in child development research. And I'm delighted to tell you that all these stellar, stellar panelists will be in a conversation with Brian Gallant, who's also a member of the Pearson Centre Advisory Board. He is also, of course, the 33rd Premier of New Brunswick and is currently serving as the CEO of the Canadian Centre for the Purpose of the Corporation at Navigator Limited. With respect to the format, the discussion will last about 40 minutes and then be followed by a Q&A period that will be moderated by Andrew Cardozo of the Pearson Centre before we end promptly at 3 p.m. Eastern. Please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Pearson YouTube channel later on this afternoon. Just go to YouTube and search for Pearson Centre. It will also be available via podcast in a few days. And on that note, I will uh, turn it over to you, Brian. Merci beaucoup, Francesca. C'est grandement apprécié. Merci beaucoup à vous tous et toutes pour nous avoir joints pour cette conversation très importante. Uh, thank you very much for joining this important conversation on child care, which is entitled, Should National Child Care Be in the Throne Speech? Certainly a timely discussion. Uh, nous avons des panélistes d'envergure dont nous sommes très fiers uh, de leur participation. Alors, uh, à, à ceux et celles qui nous écoutent, vous allez voir uh, avec la conversation, leur expertise et leur point de vue uh, lors de la prochaine heure. So we're looking forward to having a robust conversation over the next hour. So let's jump right into it. Uh, as was mentioned, we're going to be discussing the topic of child care and we're going to want to hear from all the panelists on all of the questions. So we'll sort of go through and take turns uh, on who answers first and sort of the flow of things. I'll do the best I can to make sure that we uh, are staying on time as well, because we want to get to the questions of those uh, listening in and we want to hear from them. And of course, have the panelists uh, opine on whatever it is they'd like to talk about. With that said, uh, Carrie, you'll be the first one just to give you the heads up as I uh, go through the question and then we'll go uh, Hedy, if you would maybe take the next one after, uh, that would be great. David, and then Craig, I'll try to make sure that, uh, that from my screen, the rotation is done uh, the right way. 
So the first question is, is really the, the heart of the topic today. We'll certainly cover other angles, but this is certainly, I think, right in the wheelhouse of what uh, those listening want to hear about. What would you like to advocate for? What would you like to see uh, that would be included in the throne speech with regards to this topic? Is it a focus on childcare? Is it a focus on early childhood education, early childhood development? Is it all of these things? Uh, is it uh, something about more investment? Is it something about any type of policy changes or maybe both of those things? I, and also, is it for universal programming uh, or maybe a more targeted approach? So this is, a, a, I think, a very encompassing uh, question, but it's an important one. Uh, so Carrie, if you don't mind uh, to start it off, we'd appreciate it. So not to get hung up on terms, but um, in the sector, we use the term early childhood education, recognizing that early childhood education can take place in a number of different environments, can take place in a child care center, in kindergarten, in pre-K, nursery school, um, et cetera. So what do we want to see in the throne speech? We want to see investment, substantial investment, in really good programs for kids. Now, should it end, we want to see for all kids because we know that when we zero in and we target programs, what we end up getting is poor programs for poor kids. What the pandemic has really um, uh, torn, torn the Band-Aid off here is just how deep inequity goes. And the pandemic has, has, has really um, made those fault lines even deeper. So it really means that we need to not just reopen childcare, we need to rethink it and we need to make it better. Thank you, Carrie. Hedy. Uh, I, I actually agree with Kerry. Uh, I think it's important that we don't separate child care, whatever that means, which I always think of as babysitting. Um, child care versus the whole early childhood education and childhood development. I think that is the core of what we're looking at here, giving kids not just somebody to make sure they don't trip and fall, but somebody to make sure that they actually are prepared for this world of tomorrow or today that they're going to be moving into later on, and that they are ready uh, for a constant learning and, 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 and constant education. So I think that's important. I, I think that, you know, I what I would like to see in the throne speech is something that acknowledges, as Carrie said, it didn't tear the band-aid off, it exposed like deep chasms in the system, flaws in our system that people just fell through and COVID exposed that. And so I think what we need to do is not go back to the same old, same old that we had and you know put a bow around it, but we need to start thinking about how we rebuild a new infrastructure for, for, for people no longer to fall through. So we're looking at an equitable and a just society as well as child care and early childhood education. We need to fill all the gaps and therefore we need to look at this from an intersectional point of view. Not simply what is uh, early learning and early childhood education going to look like uh, and child care, but what is it going to look like for people who are racialized, for indigenous persons, for people who are very low income or living in poverty, for middle income families. Uh, at the end of the day, it's what is it going to do for children preparing them for tomorrow and getting them that really important empowerment which i think is our ability to learn to be constant learners and to be educated in the future so that they can really walk away from whatever the challenges they face today i know it because it happened to me I was a young girl parents had a great aid education father was a tailor my mother was a secretary and the old days as you call the secretaries and uh, i i lived in social housing and education was what moved me forward and in fact i started to go to school at three in an early learning early childhood education thing so it set me up for the rest of my life empowered me not only in terms of learning but it gave me confidence helped me to learn how to live with others work with others be in a society and so i think it's an absolute we just cannot move forward unless we do this in the speech from the third i mean we could go okay. on to group structure and stuff but this is where we want to go and an equitable and just society well there'll certainly be some more more uh, time for discussion on those topics over the next uh, few moments uh, david 
Uh, yeah, I agree with the two previous speakers, of course, and, and my background is uh, special education and child development. And I think during the pandemic, the, the children on the margins have become the canaries in the coal mine of a very broken system. Uh, and that led to the dr dramatic inequities that, uh, that illustrate the dramatic inequities that many children face. The last instructional time, the trauma that many children experience, the development of gaps that have widened, the lags in skill acquisition that has occurred, children isolated in difficult homes, the hunger, the abuse they endured. Many, many children will lag for many years because of this. And I think the federal government needs to recognize that they alone can really start to address this by creating an educational system that reaches down to include the early years and establish one continuum of support for children and families that starts in the early years and continues and transitions into uh, the K-12 system. Um, the federal government you know, have made commitments to, uh, to in inclusiveness in the early years and to uh, greater access. Well, if that's the case, then they're going to have to invest in professional learning for early child educators as they face some really unique challenges that have always been there, but are now at the forefront of the conversation and that those educators are facing today in the many uh, classrooms and learning environments that they're working in. Very good points. Uh, Craig? So my background is I'm an economist and what I basically highlight is the Canadian economy is, is experiencing an economic contraction this year of a magnitude that we haven't seen outside of depression conditions. And the government actions to help support uh, Canadian households and Canadian businesses with policies to provide income support is basically allowing us to avoid the worst case scenario of, of a depression. But as the economy shrank by 18% in March and April, we have an enormous hole to dig the economy out of. So I think when when the government is is thinking about the speech from the throne, a lot of it is going to be around, you know, how do we, you know, what programs, what new initiatives do we do to help support the economy and help fuel the recovery? One of the things we know from the economic data is that, you know, amongst the three million jobs that were lost during the 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 the, the downturn and the lockdown, um, women were impacted more than more than men. And so we've pushed a lot of women out of the labor market. And the simple reality is that we know that without effective childcare, women are not going to return to the, the labor market um, the, way they, the, the way they would pre-COVID. So there is a real risk here, particularly when the, the virus is still in circulation before we have a vaccine, that you, you could have a situation where women don't return to the, 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 the the, the labor market. So this puts a, a preeminence on the issue of childcare. But going to Carrie's point, you know, I, I, I don't think of childcare as early childhood education. What what we what but at the same time that we want to, you know, that childcare is essential to for the economic recovery. What I'd stress is you use the opportunity to invest in something that will help give you stimulus in the near term, but also gives you a long term payoff. And that's that's actually what we're talking about here. So, you know, the child care component of early childhood education can be about the stimulus. The the early childhood education F emphasis can be about helping improve the outcomes that children have and actually set them up for a prosperous future. So much like there's a lot of speculation that the upcoming throne, uh, speech from the throne is going to have a focus on in you know infrastructure, but particularly green infrastructure. That's a good example of infrastructure, something that's good for stimulus for the economy. But the reason the government's gonna think about green initial, green infrastructure is because it achieves a long-term goal. And I think of th that that's exactly what we wanna think about in terms of this throne speech. We, you know, additional investment that helps to fuel the economic recovery is needed. And why don't we use that money to also serve a long-term interest in the country, such as enhancing the skills that the children develop and, make them you know better prepared for the future well thank you for that to, to all of you uh, fantastic and, and very insightful answers uh, you probably touched upon all of the follow-up questions that we had but different people followed up on different things so it'll be great to give everyone the opportunity to maybe expand on some of the uh, points that were made and, and very very poignant points of course uh, so the next question we'll maybe start off with david if that's okay uh, what are the social policy and pe pedagogical arguments 
for there to be publicly funded universal child care. Um, and please feel free to expand a little bit on anything else that might be needed uh, for the, the fulfillment of the potential of, of the benefits on a social, uh, on a social uh, realm with regards to other things that might be needed, not just the fact that it be universal and, and publicly funded. So if there are any other things that you think would be helpful uh, to ensure that we garnish the social benefits of the uh, investment, please, uh, please feel free to elaborate. So, David. Well, first of all, Brian, you should never give a Newfoundlander a microphone and ask him to elaborate on such a big question. <laughs> um, I look at social policy as human development policy, optimizing outcomes for young children and supporting families. Um, the pandemic has illustrated that Canada is not doing a good job and we need informed public policy that reflects the literature. One in five Canadian children live in poverty. UNICEF reports that Canada ranks 18 out of 35 industrialized nations for children living in poverty. We're the top of the bottom third. And international research today is conclusive in identifying that access to quality early learning environment is essential to changing the trajectory of young children's lives. Uh, children have the right to safety and security. Um, we can address the social inequities that cause the cycles of poverty, but yet UNICEF, the UNICEF calls this the principle of first call for children, the right for children to be protect from it, the first protected from adversity. It shouldn't be aspirational for us to assure children safe and secure childhoods. It should be foundational to us. If we can't do that, then as a society, as a culture, we have bigger problems uh, that need to be addressed. Um, in Canada today, only 54% of children have access to, to early learning environments, and we actually rank 33 out of 35 OECD countries for that. Uh, is that acceptable for us today? Should Canada be ranking that low? And what's the impact of that? I, mean, I came to ECE, I'm, I'm a late convert to this. I spent 40 years in special education and looking at you know, early identification and intervention, trying to help change the trajectory of children's lives because they're lagging in, in some developmental area. And we have a very poor outcome in special education. The, the, a, a referral to special education is a one-way referral. Very few come out of it. Most of these children end up lagging for years. 13-15% uh, of the population end up in special education. And 60% of them are there for lags in literacy, numeracy, language delays, and behavior regulation issues with a disproportionate number of low socioeconomic status children there. Yet the literature on early child education, the international literature, is conclusive in saying that the, the, the three biggest boosts from quality ECE is enhanced literacy and numeracy gain, uh, skills, uh, language gains, and improved behavior regulation, especially for children with low SES. So the rationale for public policy is clear. If, if we want to improve the educational outcomes and reduce the draw on social programs across the lifespan, as well as stimulate economies and address the inequities that these children face, we need to front load the investment, use our pub public dollars more efficiently. You know, public policy that listens to the research is wise policy, and I'm hoping that the throne speech reflects that. Well, hopefully uh, we also see with the pandemic and the response to it that there is a heightened awareness of the importance of, of following the research and making investments and, and decisions based on it. Uh, Kerry, uh, we'll, we'll go to you next. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of these social and pedagogical uh, arguments and benefits to, to this type of investment? Well, let's start with gender equality. Allowing women to, uh, to, to work um, closes the gap between uh, male and female uh, earnings. We know that 50% uh, of marriages and in uh, break up within the first uh, d d decade. So if you take mothers out of the workforce during their childbearing years, you're actually condemning women and their children uh, to poverty. So very, uh, very important. Childcare, early, uh, early learning childcare in itself is, a, is an industry with the potential to create good jobs, particularly good jobs for, uh, for women and for racialized uh, women in uh, pr particular. It's a good locus for um, local economic uh, d development because uh, parents and educators spend their money in their uh, local uh, economies. I don't think we think of childcare enough as being an incubator for social inclusion and a, a welcoming home for new, uh, for new Canadians. Often, 
Often it is the child care centre which provides some of the most support for uh, new Canadians and for, uh, and for re refugees. Um, it's a place for kids to have a good childhood. It's a place for a happy uh, for a happy childhood that, and I think we put a lot of emphasis on it sets kids up for good economic uh, success. But I think we should think more about how it sets kids up to be good citizens. Because if you do not have a literate population, you cannot have a democracy. And I think a bit of what we're seeing to the south of the border tells us just how dangerous that can be. Oh, thank you very much, Kerry. So I, I'm very interested, uh, of course, to see an economist now really focus on the social benefits of an investment. So, so Craig, over to you. Well, I, the reality is investments in early childhood education bring very broad-based benefits. They, they, it brings benefits to the parents, it brings benefits to the children, it brings benefits to society. And there's been a host of, of studies done in Canada and, and internationally looking at what is the rate of return that you get on, on, on each dollar that you invest in this space. And so you have, you know, if you think about the, the, the deficits that governments are spending today, you think about the, the increase in, in, in government debt, the, you know, the, the government needs to still be, you know, interest rates be interest rates might be low, but you still have to be mindful of the 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 the, the public purse. And what that means is you need to invest where you're going to get the best payoff in in the long run. And so the studies that have been done show that for every dollar you invest, you get, you know, the most conservative estimates are about a dollar and a half back on every dollar you invest, upwards of of three or four dollars. And you know, if you compare that to the return that you're going to get on other investments, it's it's significantly higher. Now there is an issue around the payoff in the short run versus the long run, and I think that that is probably one of the reasons why they we we as a country have underinvested in early childhood education. That the reality is that the economic payoffs that you get and the social payoffs you get extend way beyond one term in office, and so from a political point of view. I think this this creates a disincentive to invest in this space, but a lot of the economic analysis has shown that the biggest Im immediate impact, uh, you know, where you get the 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 immediate increase is is in terms of what Kerry was mentioning, which is getting women in the labor force and having them have better outcomes and supporting their their uh, both their economic and their socioeconomic outcomes. And then you get the longer term benefits that are the, the, pay, the payoff to, to children. And when you think about the, the benefits that go into essential skills like literacy and numeracy and, and critical thinking skills, these are, these are benefits that pay off over the lifetime of a child, right? So, you know, it, it is far cheaper to deal with development issues earlier than to do it later in life. And so in point of fact, you can actually be saving money. And I'm not the expert here. You know, uh, Dr. Philpott should be speaking to this. The, the reality is that, that you know, you, you know when, you, when you see kids that catch up later in school, the, the question you gotta ask yourself is how much did that cost? Right, because if you actually invested earlier on and they didn't have that development problem uh, to start with, you'd actually save money. So I, I actually think that when the government is considering different alternative investments, you know, where should they put their money? You know, the, the, the reality is, and all the literature shows, that investments in early childhood education have one of the strongest payoffs you're gonna get. Penny, uh, very excited to hear what you have to say. And, and maybe if you wanted to comment quickly as well on, on what Craig was saying with regards to maybe the, the issue of, it's a long-term investment, which makes it a bit tougher for maybe the political class to be able to prioritize that type of investment. But please, uh, on the social benefits and social arguments for the investment. Thanks, Brian. I think the thing is that everyone, I agree with what everyone said. I mean, you look at childcare, you look at uh, early childhood development. This is about helping to empower women. We're never going to achieve gender equality uh, as well, in, not in the broad sense, but in the, in, the, in the sense of women playing a role in society, unless we look at childcare. I think that Kerry said that well. Uh, we, women can be empowered to go into the workforce. It also looks at the lifetime of a woman. When she gets to be a senior, we have a lot of senior women uh, who were never in the workforce, who are now living on very low income, OAS, GIS, et cetera. This gives them some kind of way 
to have some a CPP or some kind of retirement income so they are not living in poverty. So you take that all the way down to the woman's life. Then look at the child. Look at the investment in society. I think Craig and uh, David said it very, very well. They, they were the economic arguments for this. Uh, there are the productivity and competitiveness arguments for this as you look globally we bring up a society of children who are socially capable who are good citizens who have the ability to learn and have constant learning get skills and whatever Canada then becomes a very productive and competitive nation from that economic perspective it is a long-term investment and I'm going to say that the biggest problem in achieving this I mean, I have been so long in the tooth that I can remember when we discussed it around the cabinet table with Jean Chrétien. It's something we wanted to do and we butt up against the constitutional challenge, as Brian knows very well, of that's a provincial jurisdiction and the federal government cannot do anything about it unless we say they can. And many provinces weren't ready that early in the game. I think COVID has allowed us to see that provinces, the federal government can actually put aside literally you know maybe forget the constitutional arguments but we can work together to achieve certain goals this is probably the most important goal we can do in terms of economic social educational skills and training global competitiveness that we can ever hope for and gender equity that we can ever hope for so i think that we need to start building on the relationship we've developed with provinces during covid and saying can we can we guys can we come up with some clear sense of where we want to go with this is going to be but everybody let's work together on it and my argument always though which Brian may disagree with is that when the federal government transfers money it needs to tie a rope to it so that we can have conditions put that are national and not have one province doing thing a and another province doing thing b I mean we need to look at the universality of this and it's universal benefits as well so I think I agree with everybody and I really think that the using this as an aspirational jump off thing which is what a throne speech is about i actually think you might find as a political vote for this thank you very much for that i i certainly won't take the bait though because we could go into a constitutional <laughs> webinar here but uh a great uh, a great that would be a great conversation nonetheless uh so now let's talk a little bit about the economic arguments although many of you touched upon it uh, alors, pour une minute, nous voulons parler un peu de, de c'est quoi les, les arguments économiques en faveur de la mise en place de services de garderie d'enfants universels financés par l'État. And, and maybe for this question, uh, and Craig, I'll go to you to start off. Maybe for this question, try to make the case, if, if you believe this to, to, to be the case, that investment should go to this instead of, say, the typical uh, what, what people would typically see as economic investments and innovation, other things that would be for productivity and infrastructure, uh, things of that nature. So contrast that, because obviously to put ourselves in the, in, the, in the spot of some of the decision makers, they obviously have all these pressures when it comes to economic development and, and making sure that we're as productive as possible uh, here in Canada. They have all these different uh, people trying to trying to uh, trying to convince them to make a certain investment so comparing it to, to some of those things would be I think quite interesting for for those listening so Craig well this sort of builds on what I was already remarking on in terms of like looking at an investment and saying okay so you know where do I put my fiscal dollars and where am I going to get the best return on my investment and as I already said like the the economic multipliers that you get from this are really significant um, so you know the the payoff the payoff is is enormously positive. But the thing that makes the current environment different is that you know if we go back and we look at every other business cycle in Canada, you know every every time you know we look at the recessions of the early 70s, early 80s, early 90s, uh, 2008, 2009, you know there was a pretty clear economics textbook sort of response to those to those downturns, right? So if the economy experiences a downturn. You provide some additional uh, support to unemployed workers through things like enlarged employment insurance um, or easier access to employment insurance, and then, and then, and then beyond that, it's about raising demand in the economy, and it's about it's about you know that's why the policy recommendation tends to be okay, you know, do infrastructure right because you're going to get you know infrastructure. Uh, has a bigger impact on boosting economic activity than tax cuts or additional government spending. But what makes the current downturn unique, you know, is it because it's been caused by a pandemic, the nature of the economic 
uh, scars that are being created are different than other cycles. So as I said, you know, if we actually look back in other business cycles, other recessions, we, we actually have not seen um, women impacted as much as they are during COVID-19. We've seen, you know, and as a consequence, the, the labor market is fundamentally behaving differently this time around than it has behaved in any of the, the, the prior, prior recessions. And in my mind, that also suggests that perhaps the policy response should be different. So much like the government, you know, the government's decision to, um, you know, introduce the CERB, uh, the, the $500 a week benefit and the wage subsidy was, you know, not in the playbook in past recessions. Similarly, if we think about, you know, in terms of the throne speech about setting out a vision for the future of Canada and thinking about how do we build a prosperous Canada, you could make a, a you could make the argument that the policy responses to this recession should also be different because of the nature of it. And uh, one of the things I think that the 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 current recession has made very clear, and and this is this came up earlier in our conversation, was it, it actually revealed the importance of childcare in a very dramatic way because lots of parents were wondering like. How do I go back to work? The schools are shut down, and and so I, you know I think at the, you know anytime the the political system wants to make you know big investments, they you know you want to make investments that are you know make good economic sense, but you also want you also want to tie it to it's what the 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 voters support. And I actually think there's probably more support now about childcare than there has been in recent years because people can now actually see how essential it is. So now is a is a is a great opportunity to say that you know we're going to do something that has made economic sense for decades and we've underinvested, but now we actually have a moment when the public will actually support it. The other dimension here is that if we go back in time. Um, if we go back in time, uh, the emphasis of, for economists like myself has always been on, you know, promoting economic growth and we need growth and we need an re economic recovery. But I think in recent years, there's been an increased appreciation that we also need inclusive growth. And this again goes back to Carrie's point about, you know, if you, if people don't feel like they're getting ahead, if they don't think they're getting the standard of living they deserve, if they don't think the system has their back or is supporting them, you're going to get pressures for political changes that you might not want to have, right? And we've seen this in terms of Brexit. We've seen this in terms of some political outcomes around the world. So when we think about inclusive growth, I think that there's a fundamental early childhood education dimension to this. Because if we think about it as education, and it is education, right? It is about skills development, right? If we think this is about education, why do Canadians think it's acceptable that some people have more capacity to give their children ECE versus others? Because if we went to parents and said, you know what, from a point of view of the primary school education system, we think, you know, we think it's okay if the rich can afford good education, but the rest of you, you have to get by. You know, I think Canadians would find that reprehensible. But the argument is exactly the same for early childhood education. And this is where you get into sort of the neural development argument that says, like, the, the, the neural evidence is kids' brains develop much more than we previously thought. And so education starts from birth. And what that means is that investments in the space is about expanding education. And there's a strong inclusive inclusivity dimension to this. So if you have a government that's in favor of, of, of inclusive economic growth, there's an argument for expanded investment in this space. Thank you, Craig. And an interesting uh, extension to what you mentioned, uh, the, the investments to stimulate the economy and infrastructure that governments often do. Uh, well, studies would show that that predominantly creates economic opportunity and jobs for men. Uh, so it, it does uh, potentially exacerbate some of the challenges that uh, has been mentioned by many panelists uh, already in this webinar with regards to 
uh, women having a harder impact and a more negative impact with the pandemic, economically speaking, financially, in terms of job losses, and, and studies would show in other, in other realms as well, which is certainly a topic in this question of, uh, of exactly, um, uh, of, of exactly this, um, this, uh, this gender disparity that I would love to hear the, the other uh, panelists expand on as well, because it certainly is something that I think many are living, and the, stu the studies are very disconcerting to see uh, that not only during the pandemic, but in the economic recovery, that women risk uh, lagging behind in terms of uh, of the of the um, job gains again, and in terms of uh, the financial and economic security because of the structures that are in place. And and I'm sure childcare, uh, from what everyone has said, could play a role in helping mitigate it. So, Hedy, um, uh, on this topic, and maybe even expanding on some of the gender challenges created by the pandemic and the economic recovery based on the pandemic. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, when you originally asked the question about typically we talked about investing economically in the economics and economic growth, we always looked at investing in like oil and gas and industry and all of that kind of thing. I think back in the 19, late 1960s when we had our very first global economic summit and we had this parallel thing called TOES, the other economic summit, when people started to say, stop being a linear thinker. You don't just invest in, in economic growth by only looking at economic investments. You look at how you invest in people. And as we well know, this generation is about people. It's not necessarily about the, the, you know, the, the um, resources, natural resources. It's about investing in people. So it is a strong investment. But I wanted to say a little bit about why this is important. And I know we talk about gender equity. I look at gender equity from a very different perspective. It's not only about giving women equal opportunity to participate in the economic, social, and political life of the country, but it is about helping men to take their role in being part of that family development, childhood development, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, Norway is a good example of what is a great set of social programs looking at how if we wanted women to get into the paid workforce, we should also say, what we do with regard to this is also helping men. Because as men take their role doing, looking after kids, if they choose to, this is a choice they can make now, they're also going to benefit from some of these things, being able to take time off work and get you know, parental leave. We see a lot of young men are doing this already and, and building this. But the big thing that we need to look at is pay equity. This is something we said, how do we get women to close the gap? We haven't closed the gap. The gap has been there for forever in terms of pay equity, you know, which is equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, we're even seeing a lot of it talking about how phys female physicians are not earning as much as male physicians. And there was a big argument for how, why that has happened and why this has been allowed to happen. So I think the gender equity piece is an important piece. We are now not no longer talking about gender as binary anymore. We have to look at gender as being a broader construct so that there are a whole lot of people who need to participate and can benefit from looking at gender. But I, but I still think that we need to stop talking about economic growth as a linear construct and go back to the other economic summit at the end of the, the 60s when people started saying economic growth, social infrastructure, investing in people are all part of one. It's going to get us to the place we want to go. That is the objective we need to aim for, and we cannot ignore this. And I mean, if you wanted to use a very, you know, hackneyed term, investing in early learning, investing in, uh, in childcare, investing in early childhood development is a, a, a goal of investing in human beings in this country, getting them to realize whatever potential they may have down the road. And so, you know, this is about creating opportunity for everyone. And that cuts across all that intersectional thing about, you know, persons who are, are not, you know, equally able or not equally able, racialization, poverty. It cuts across all that. It, it diminishes those barriers immediately. And it allows everyone to participate fully. And I think that that is the goal of any thriving society. And, you know, I, I just think that, that that's, for me, the argument about this whole gender equity thing. It's need to look at gender broadly, 
we need to look at how this also gives men an opportunity to take a part in the unpaid work that women have been doing for centuries uh, with nothing to show for it. Uh, and it might be that we even kind of learn how to develop a formula which we floated in 1995 at the Beijing conference, which is, can we get a formula that says that if a woman chooses to stay in the house and bring up the kids and do all the other things that she is doing, she should have some reimbursement for that unpaid work, because it is essential work. If you get somebody to come and look after your kids at home, you pay them. But the woman says at him she does all of this and she never got paid and at the end she became a low-income senior still dependent on her part uh, in those days her husband's uh, income and her husband's cpp so it really allows for equity throughout the spectrum age spectrum throughout the broad spectrum of giving everybody that opportunity to be able to benefit from it so it's a major, I, if you want to say, I think it is one of the biggest investments, as, as, as Craig said, we could make in the development <clears throat> of our of human beings in this country and making us back to the thing, very productive and one of the most competitive nations in the world. And you're right, 33 out of 35 is not great. And so if we want to be competing out there in the real world, we need to get our act together and start investing in our people. That was fantastic, Hedy, and I think you've done a, an excellent job, as you always do, of eloquently framing the conversation uh, the way it should be, in the sense that these investments uh, should not be just pegged as social investments. They very much are economic investments as well, and I think the panelists and all the arguments that you've made for, for the questions so far has certainly demonstrated that. Uh, David, uh, over to you, and, and again, um, maybe even point blank in, in your opinion, and then carry uh, afterwards, uh, is, is investment in this, uh, if we can get this into the throne speech and have a major focus on it, is it a way to, to help ensure that we are addressing uh, some of the, the concerns that have been uh, created with the pandemic with regards to the gender disparity uh, and any other economic uh, arguments that you would like to put forward? Oh, God, this is such a good conversation. I'm enjoying listening to it, let alone participating in it. Um, it ch raising children with developmental issues or challenges disproportionately impacts mothers. Uh, moms are the ones who get called in school. Moms are the ones who have to take time off work to bring children to uh, appointments. If a parent has to stay at home because they can't find a, a childcare space for their child with autism, it is most often the moms. So, so the impact on moms is, is widespread, uh, uh, especially from my perspective of developmental uh, uh, challenges in kids. But the other side of the economic argument that we haven't mentioned here is we're spending a lot of money because we're not doing this well. Look at the cost of a child not graduating high school. Look at the cost of a child going down the addictions road. Look at the cost of the justice system uh, and, and on and on from there. Uh, in, 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 in childhood disabilities, we have what's called primary and secondary characteristics. Primary characteristics being the lag in reading or the inability to speak uh, articulately or the inability to complete math or the struggle with your behavior regulation. We can address those fairly uh, successfully in one way. But the secondary characteristics are the ones that cost in the long term, the eroded self-esteem, the, the marginalization from their peer groups, the, the sense that they're dumb and they can't succeed, the, 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 the marginalization that leads to addictions and to underemployment and unemployment and leaving school early, and the cycle of poverty that begins because of those decisions. So when we're looking at, from my perspective, when we're looking at whether or not to invest more, I consider we need to look at how we can invest, invest more effectively, use our public dollars more efficiently to reduce the draw that we're already expending uh, in, in this country on these kids. And I Fantastic. also have to say, support what Penny just said, I think if, if we got to a point where dads were able to take a year off and stay home and raise their, raise their young children, we would have a radically different society. If all dads were able to do that, we would have a radically different society. Well, and, and like you, David, I'm really happy that Hedy had raised that point. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, Kerry. 
I think we need to consider the consequences if mothers aren't allowed to, aren't, aren't helped to get back into the workforce. Um, mothers contribute about 47% of the family's, uh, uh, to, towards the family's finances. For that money to be scraped out of the, um, away from the, the, the family would, would push about one third of Canadian families below the poverty line. And the consequences for that going forward, for women, for children, for the economy are immense. Mm. So this isn't something that's a, an intellectual discussion any longer. Uh, we have created an economy uh, and a social structure which requires both parents to be in the workforce. Uh, we take one of them out and the uh, and it'll be de devastating. We will have a, uh, a recession which will go on and on and on. Uh, the other thing that we should consider and and I know, you know, and Hetty, you no doubt know all of the, these years, you know, when we're when we're talking to policymakers about the importance of this, there's always this thing in the background as well. You know, I'm I'm in office for most four four years. You're asking me to put out big money, and I'm never going to see the uh, you know the the benefits of it. But in fact, Quebec's experiment has showed us that this is just the opposite. Because when it got out the door quickly with, uh, with accessible uh, childcare, we saw things happen quite fast. One was that um, with mothers entering the workforce, the taxes that they paid more than paid for the cost of the program. And that happened right away. And that was something that took 20 years to, to realize. That happened in the years that mothers entered the, the workforce. They built up um, enough payments through, the, uh, through their, their taxes and their increased, increased spending in order to pay for the program. As David was um, alluding to, there was less draw on social welfare pr programs because with higher income, these families were no longer uh, um, uh, could avail themselves to social welfare programs. We saw the number of mothers, uh, lone mothers on, uh, on social welfare cut in half. The other thing we saw is that Quebec went from having um, the lowest presence of women in post-secondary education to the highest. Quebec now um, graduates more women doctors, more lawyers, more, uh, more pr pr professionals than ever before, and than any other province. So if you know, if we're only looking at this through a women's equity lens, uh, there's no doubt that if if uh, if we want to have children in society, like if we still want a society where we're going to have Canadian-born children, uh, then we have to uh, we have to put in the groundwork with, which allows women to balance uh, being a mother and being part of uh, of the workforce. Carrie, I think you just you just raised such an important point, and and I I will build on that. I think Craig had mentioned another element as well that investments in this will will help in many ways. Craig had pointed out it's a stimulus, so it's it's a way to to have a stimulus that also will have a longer term impact. And and the points that you just made in terms of the impact on social programming right away, the impact of women being able to uh, f go and fulfill their potential uh, in the workforce. Uh, with regards to helping the family unit, uh, helping the women themselves, of course, and their children, but also helping businesses that uh, desperately need qualified workers, uh, and I would argue desperately need to make sure that they have different perspectives within their workforce as well. So just phenomenal points, Gary. Thank you for that. Uh, so we're, we're starting to get some questions coming in. So I, I have one that, that I think is uh, very important because somebody listening to this will say, well, then it's a no-brainer. I mean, look at all the reasons as to why this should happen, why major investments should be put into this, why this should be a focus of the throne speech. There's economic, social uh, social reasons. There's reasons for the economic recovery of COVID. There's reasons in the long term and the short term. I mean, it seems like it's a no-brainer. So what are the barriers to this happening? Are, are they financial barriers, essentially just the, the choices that need to be made by governments? Uh, are they policy barriers somehow, jurisdictional barriers, uh, or is it maybe just the lack of political will? So uh, very, 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 uh, very excited to hear people's thoughts on that. So uh, Hedy, we'll, we'll start with you if that's okay. Why is this not happening already if there are all these very valid reasons as to why it should? Uh, I think it's about perception. Now, I'm speaking here as a politician. 
politicians are loath to do things where they are so far ahead of the public perception that they get crucified for doing it. And so when the public gets what the outcome of a particular piece of public policy is going to be, then they buy into it because people will go like, oh, you know, look at that, that's such a dumb thing to do, blah, 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 blah. And then you don't get re you don't get reelected and you don't get to do the policy anyway. Somebody else who doesn't agree with the policy gets there. So there is that reality of why it isn't done. But I do think that, I mean, having been around this block for such a very, very long time, I will tell you that the, the, what I've learned in politics and public policy is that the penny drops. It doesn't just go climbing and rushing down to the bottom, it drops little by little by little. And so you have to make your case for why, which is what we're trying to do here, why this is an excellent ex uh, investment and why we can't look at economic policy and social policy as separate linear things, why they're so um, tied together and so important, why it's very important for a family to have both partners participating fully in the rearing of their children, in the, in, the, in the economic growth of their family unit, all of that, you know, this is important. And I think we hopefully want to do that. You made a point earlier on that governments don't do certain things because it's all four year term, right? If before I get into the next election, I don't show results of what I did, I'm not going to get reelected. And that is an, an absolute truth. But you know what? I think if you look back, and I would think that the biggest crisis we ever faced that is almost equivalent to this pandemic was World War II. And we came out of World War II and we rebuilt a new society. If you look at the benefits of some of those things that came in after World War II, CPP, uh, student loans, uh, housing policies, all of those things, they actually bore fruit. They were kind of like, what, 40, 50 years ago, it's time to change all of that, doesn't work anymore. We need to up it and to bring in new infrastructure for looking at how we deal with it. And that isn't a good enough argument. And COVID exposed the reason why we now have to do it. And so I remember when we first came in and Gretchen wanted to do a childcare, he promised it in the red book. And of course he didn't do it. And, and it was because he butted up against provincial provinces saying, no, no, that's not a thing for us. We don't want to do that. But at the end of the day, slowly, uh, it, when Martin came in, which we were talking about 12 years later, provinces were beginning to say, yeah, 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 we're interested in this. Yeah, we can see the benefit of it now. So I always find that, you know, one of the most important things about political will is to see beyond that and to say this is an opportunity for us to build a new set of infrastructure for Canada by infrastructure, I mean social, economic, et cetera, that will be there 40 years from now. The 40 years from now, we can look back and say, hey, this paid off in spades, but that takes a lot of political risk, a lot of political courage, and a lot of political vision to do it. And I would suggest to you that Lester Pearson started that vision, and we're, and uh, Pierre Trudeau picked it up. I'm, I'm not being partisan here, guys, right? I'm not. Um, and then we're now looking at, but another Trudeau who could have that foresight to say, you know what, I'm building for the next 30 years. And, you know, I, I am, may not be around to see that happen, but, I, but one has to believe that that's what government's role is, to take the plunge, uh, to go ahead and do things that will really make a difference. Hedy, thank you for your commentary, especially on the political challenges. Uh, we, we very much appreciate your candor. Craig, I know you have another webinar, so I'm going to let you jump in. Uh, we appreciated you making sure that you squeeze this one in, as I'm sure it's an important topic for you. So, so please, uh, Craig, uh, let us know what you think, uh, why you think this has not happened yet. Well, I think investments in this space have been a no-brainer for decades. Um, I, I think that my, you know, I think that the, the the big challenges in the past have been the the fact that there hasn't been public pressure to 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 make real progress in this area. Um, I often find that, you know, I've written a number of research papers on this and when I get when you get feedback, um, you know, feedback in social media, in emails, um, there's a there is a deep confusion in the public between child care um, and and early childhood education. You know, in the public, I think many cases people are thinking about this in terms of of base, like 
you know, like glorified babysitting and not the fundamental education that it actually is. And I think that, you know, when the public doesn't put pressure on the political system, um, the political system is going to have a tendency to, 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 to make other things a priority, particularly when it's something where you're going to get a long-term payoff. And I agree with Carrie that you do get an immediate payoff, right? Because the Quebec example was a brilliant example. But I, you know, I, I think that when you talk to politicians about this area, you know, they'll immediately think of the benefits to the children. And 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 that's like outside of the the political the political mandate. Then there's the federated model. It seems you know the the simple reality is every time you find a major public policy problem in Canada, and invariably you find that there's something about you know federal provincial relations that is creating an an impediment. And you know education is a education is a provincial matter. The provinces are not going to have the money for this. Right? The provinces are facing enormous pressures on healthcare costs. We've got aging populations putting enormous pressure outside of COVID on the healthcare system. The level of government that actually has the, the funds to help address this is the federal government, not the provinces. And so, you know, you could do this as a, as a, fiscal, a fiscal transfer. But to, but to the point that was actually made earlier, again, if you think about the environment we're in right now, right, the federal government is, is working with the provinces as to how do we deal with a health crisis and, and, and a recession. So there's good communication happening now between our federal government and our provinces. This is a good time to have that conversation about, about early childhood education. The public actually has a bigger appreciation of the importance and value of child care even if they don't see it as education, they get they have a much stronger appreciation around childcare. And then I think you know we have a federal government who has made it very clear that what they want is inclusive, sustainable growth. And I actually think this checks all three boxes. This will help on inclusivity. It'll help on 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 you know if you think about sustainability on the in the you know if you think about essential skills development. People with stronger essential skills do things like Carrie mentioned. They, they, they become more socially involved. They get out and vote more. They, they also make better life choices. Um, you know, they, they're, they're more conscious around issues related to the environment. Like what you find is that building essential skills is fundamental to your, to, to your human capital. So if we actually look at just the elements of like what the, what the, what have been the barriers in the past to making investments here? Um, the current environment actually makes it more, I think, more palatable uh, politically to to do something today on this than maybe it was in 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 the past. So there is an opportunity. I think the challenge is going to be that having already run a massive deficits, the question is going to be, you know, are they willing to put to put money in this space? And you know, I think ultimately we're going to end up needing stimulus, and I think this does fit into uh, a stimulus, uh, a stimulus platform. Thank you, Craig, uh, Carrie, and David. In that order, uh, about sixty seconds because we're we're running up uh, on our on our hour. So, Carrie, I think what we need is political bravery. And when we've seen um, when we've seen political leaders operate that way, they um, they got good good results. Quebec did not ask for five dollar a day childcare. There was no great demand from the public for for that. It took the political leadership to say we're going to do, to do this. It became the most popular program uh, in Quebec uh, that Quebec has ever had, and is uh, you know and people across the country wish they had it they had it too. So this is a way for um, a federal government has a role in providing equity across uh, jurisdictions. Here's their opportunity to ensure that all Canadian children get what Quebec children have. Very interesting point. Thank you, Kerry. David. Well, I would say never miss the opportunity provided by a good crisis. We now have a, had the opportunity to collaborate. We now have the opportunity to think differently and to, to, to really think outside the box as to uh, uh, addressing the, the issues that this pandemic has illustrated that young children face and young families are dealing with. Uh, so in that tone of collaboration and, and unique thinking, and this is an opportunity not to be missed. David, that's fantastic. Uh, all of the panelists, what wonderful insights. Very much appreciate your time. The Pearson Center did a phenomenal job of getting 
uh, different individuals from the country that have different perspectives. So, so thank you very much for uh, your time. Um, I'm not sure if Andrew, if you're on the line. Yes, can Andrew, you hear me? That we hear you now, Andrew. So please, okay. uh, over to you. So I'm not sure if it's just me, Andrew. I, I don't hear you at, at now. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, we hear you now. Okay, I just want to thank I want to thank you, Brian, for your excellent moderating as usual. A uh, special thank you to Craig Alexander and Kerry McQuaid for joining us. I want to do a special thank and and David Philpot, uh, in, incredible um, additions to this issue of early childhood education and childcare. I want to do a special thank you to Hetty Fry. She made made a few mentions of having worked on this for a long time. I want to tell you that next month she will have been a member of Parliament for 27 years, and she is in the history books of Canada the longest-serving female member of Parliament as of now. So thank you, Hetty, for your work over 27 years and your continuing work, and I expect the next 27 years as well. Thank you, Andrew. Um, that's kind of pushing it. The next 20, maybe the next 20, but 27 is pushing. <laughs> Go, go for it, go for it. Uh, I, I want to do a special thank you to the Honorable uh, Margaret McCain as well uh, for her sponsorship of today, but more importantly for her long-standing uh, and, and just non-stop uh, support for early childhood education. Uh, she has done a lot across the country to make this case and, and I think uh, uh, she, she will continue to be in a major force, especially in the weeks ahead as I think my, things might change. I just want to tell our audiences about two more webinars coming up next week. On September the 14th, we have a webinar on the public service of the future, looking at how the public service has performed over the pandemic and where we go next. And on September the 16th, we, we have a session on cybersecurity in the age of COVID, especially with regards to remote working. Uh, so please join us for that. And thank you once again, everybody. Uh, and uh, stay safe, wash your hands, and keep that uh, social distancing going. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.